Tom, and a good reminder that one day our accountability time is coming before the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for the challenge and song. Let's take our Bibles, please. Turn to 1 John chapter number 5. 1 First, First John chapter 5. Uh, this morning, and uh, we, uh, I can't remember exactly, in the last couple weeks or so, we started looking at this uh, passage of Scripture in First John, and uh, reviewed a little bit of that, and coming back from a different angle this morning, First John chapter number 5, and uh, we'll begin reading here in verse 10, First John chapter number 5, and verse number 10. And the Bible tells us here, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And that's really the end of it. Uh, whether or not an individual is saved depends upon what they believe about what God said about his Son, Jesus Christ. And it all comes back around to faith. There are a lot of, there are a lot of uh, tools we use in trying to help people believe in Jesus Christ. But in the end, they must come to the point of faith. The just shall live by faith. Uh, and so no, all of the convincing and maybe all of the persuasion uh, in every individual's heart, there must become a moment of faith. And uh, that means more, of course, than just believing that Jesus existed. It means that we, uh, as individuals, must come to the point of trusting completely what Jesus did for us on the cross of Calvary to pay for our sin, relying completely upon His good work. The Bible says in verse 11, And this is the record that God hath given to us, eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Lord, we are thankful now for the time in your word and how we desperately need the word of God, especially, Lord, in a day and age like this. Now, I pray that you will help us to be attentive unto your word. Lord, help us to be sensitive to the work of the Spirit by the word, uh, because it is the word of God that has the power uh, to turn our hearts and minds unto thee. And so we pray, help us now. Guide our thoughts. I pray, Father, cleanse me of sin. Help me to be faithful to your word, faithful to you. And God, use me, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I wonder how many of you this morning have heard about the Great Awakening. Maybe you've heard of the history of that. It was a religious revival that impacted the English colonies in America during the 1730s and 40s. Now that was a good while ago. The movement came at a time when the idea of secular rationalism was being emphasized and passion, energy, excitement uh, for, the, for the things of God had grown stale. In many ways, religion was becoming more formal and less personal, and that led to lower church attendance. Christians were feeling complacent, and uh, their methods of worship, and uh, with their methods of worship, and some were disillusioned with how wealth and rationalism were dominating the culture. Now, that describes the news this morning. In the United States of America, the colonies were religiously divided, and the, and the condition of it all desperately needed a movement of the hand of Almighty God. 
And in 1741, Jonathan Edwards gave his infamous and emotional sermon entitled Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And uh, news of, the, uh, of that message spread quickly throughout the colonies. It definitely was a wake-up call from God. And then there were other men such as George Whitfield and David Brainerd and many other preachers that were used mightily during that time. Uh, by the way, I might add, preachers' names who are not mentioned much in our society anymore, and I believe we're the worse off for it. Uh, great crowds gathered by the thousands, and there were untold numbers of professions of faith in Christ. And that was because of a renewed emphasis on the, pre uh, first of all, on the holiness of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, our churches aren't much interested in that type of thing anymore. We're more interested in being successful. We are more interested in um, our reputation and testimony in the world with regard to the world. We are more interested in becoming internet sensations. And, you know, we have preachers now, and have for some time, really, since the beginnings of the time of the internet, that write their sermons more with the mind of its publication than its faithfulness to God's Word. And uh, is it any wonder, then, that we find ourselves in the same condition uh, that early America found itself. Yes. Um, interestingly, it didn't take long to realize that some of those that had claimed salvation had never really been born again, even in the Great Awakening. Scores of people were not showing evidence of their conversion in their lifestyle. And that led some to call the Great Awakening an emotional bath without any true conversions. And so partly in defense of true salvation and partly to expose false conversions, Jonathan Edwards wrote a book entitled A Treatise Concerning Religious Affections. And uh, he came to the conclusion that the only way to prove whether or not one was saved was to examine whether or not they had these holy affections. That is, a zeal and longing for holy things. A zeal and longing for... Uh, for God and for personal holiness. He wrote, The principal evidence of saving grace is holy practice. The principal evidence of saving grace is holy practice. This is another way of saying what Jesus said uh, in uh, uh, in Matthew 7, ye shall know them by their fruits. Now, to grab a context on this, let's go back to Matthew chapter number 7 and uh, read the Savior's words here. Matthew chapter number 7. You see, back in those days in colonial America, I'm sure there were some very interesting people and preachers that lived in that time. I have no doubt. Because people have been the same all across the, uh, the span of history. <laughs> but I'll tell you one thing. If you study church history, and I'm talking about the right of church history, the correct, the correct side of church history... You will not find the emphasis on this entertainment-driven mess that we've fallen prey to in our age. 
They believed the Bible and they wanted to get hold of God. And they wanted God to get hold of them. Matthew chapter number 7 and verse number 13, Jesus said, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. They look like sheep, but they're not sheep. He says inwardly they're ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the lake of fire. Wherefore, by your fruits, or excuse me, by their fruits, ye shall know them. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven... And the idea of that is twofold. One, the will of God is not that we work for our salvation. You'll remember uh, the uh, individual that came to Jesus and said, What good work must I do in order to uh, have eternal life? And Jesus said, This is it, believe. Amen. Believe, because all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. So the will of God is not that people work for their salvation, but the will of God is that people repent of their sin and believe in, trust on the Lord Jesus Christ and him alone as their Savior. Amen. That's the will of God. The second aspect of this would be that once one has been born again, they will be known by the fruits in the sense that they will begin to live for the will and purpose of God and not their own. Verse 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. Now hold on a minute. Uh, they, they appeared to be doing religious work. They appeared to be doing the ministry of God. And a lot of it. And they had it on their list. Uh, that's the way a lot of religious people do. They got a whole mental list. You know, used to be somebody would say when you was witness somebody, ask them when they get, if you get to heaven and, and Peter asks you why he should let you in, what are you going to say? And I'm telling you, there are people got a whole list ready to give of all of their good works and all of their religiosity. But the Savior said here, verse 23, Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield and all them fellas, Brainerd, they were fully aware. We're talking about what we would say are pillars of church history. Men who had the power of God on their life. They had the power of God in their message and still had false confer conversions in their ministry. Look at Colossians chapter number 1. Colossians chapter 1. And verse 3. Colossians 1 and verse 3. And the Bible says, We give thanks to God, Colossians 1 and 3, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. And of the love which you have to all the saints. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. Whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. Which is come unto you as it is in all the world. Look now. And bringeth forth fruit. As it doth also in you. Since the day you heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth. In other words, what Paul was saying here, uh, we rejoice in all of God's goodness that has 
uh, uh, been revealed to you and been done in you since you heard the gospel and believed it and it brought forth fruit in your life. You shall know them by their fruits. True salvation always produces a change of nature. And this must be true. In light of the Bible's declaration in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4 that believers are partakers of the divine nature. Now watch now. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now that means they were saved out of their sin. But look. Can we say that we've escaped corruption if we turn around and go right back to it? Again, we're reminded that the Bible's clear. When individuals are truly born again, they are made new creatures. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. God changes them forever. We have in our day increasingly a lot of religious worldlings. And we'll say more about that in a moment, but because uh, by salvation, our nature is changed from defiled to divine, we can therefore confidently conclude that if there is no sanctification, there is no salvation. I remember years ago when, uh, as a pastor in uh, missionary pastor in Japan, we had a guest speaker come through on one occasion, one well, number of occasions, but on one occasion, and uh, a man that was well known across the country, pastored a a well-known church at the time. And so I took the opportunity to pick his brain when he came through. And I asked him, I said, Dear uh, doctor, I said, let me ask you this. As you travel our country, what is the prevailing problem that you see, the challenge to the work of the Holy Ghost in the Bible that you see in our churches? Didn't even hesitate. I don't even think he took a breath. He said, worldliness. I don't think that's changed much. Frightening, really. In the same year that Edwards published uh, uh, the treatise concerning religious affections, the popular teaching asserted that the only true evidence of salvation, listen, was based on an experience at the moment of conversion. That's popular today. Sunday, July 12th, 2020. And a lot of these services going on right in our neighborhood are driven at emotionalism over biblical truth. That's right. Emotionalism over biblical truth. And so the end result is then these strange testimonies of weird happenings. Like the lady I told you about recently, matter of fact just recently. When I asked her if she was saved, she said she was. I said, well, how do you know you're saved? And she said, because I had a car wreck recently, and then when I did, I had a warm feeling come over me. That's emotional experience-ism. Is that a word? <laughs> she didn't know anything about her sin. She might have believed she was a sinner, but there was no mention about repentance, no, no mention about faith in Jesus Christ. And the same thing was going on even in the Great Awakening. It's not what those men of God intended for it to be. But the devil always tries to get a foothold. And so in response to this experience-based uh, conversion movement, movement Edwards wrote, 
Assurance is never to be enjoyed on the basis of past experience. There is need of the present and continuing work of the Holy Spirit in giving assurance. So what he's saying there is this, that once salvation is uh, in the heart of an individual, the Holy Spirit of God doesn't just work in that one moment for, a, uh, for an emotional experience, but he continues to work and give evidence in the life of that believer for the rest of their life in this life. And throughout this book of 1 John, there are a series of proofs, if you will, to determine whether or not this continuing work of the Holy Ghost is evident in the life of professing believers to confirm if these professors are possessors. We, we see, uh, you remember in the Lord's parable with the sowing of the seed. He talks about those who sprung up in shallow soil. That's emotionalism. Here's what happens. They get excited about the Bible. They have some movement in their heart and mind emotionally in a service. And so they say that they have become Christians. But then the Bible says when the sun comes up and begins to beat upon them. And the real trials and burdens and difficulties of life begin to come. They wither and fade away. There are numbers without end of fair weather professors in Jesus Christ. And we're warned against Allowing that to be the state in our life. Look, every professor in Christ must consider these truths at some point. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, Examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Now listen. I've had people come to me and said, Preacher, I need you to tell me whether or not I'm saved. Well, man, I can't do that. I mean, that's like Abraham and his wife there when she said, Give me children or I die. And Abraham said, Who in the world do you think I am? <laughs> and uh, Paul said, Prove your... look." Your relationship uh, with God is just that. It is your relationship. And you and God have to come to terms of peace. Nobody can give that to you. There's no such thing in the Bible as proxy faith. But it's a very important warning because he said, Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you. Listen, except ye be reprobate. Now, I'll grant you that there are a lot of people in pews trying to do good, trying to do right, trying to do the religious thing, the God-honoring thing. But in the background of their life is all kind of reprobate living. And rather than come to the point of repentance and faith and stop putting on a show, they keep trying to put on and pretend like everything's all right in the kingdom. Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Uh, and uh, somebody will say, well, now look, are you trying to cause us to, are you trying to cause us to feel like we're not saved? Uh, look, I, I can't do that neither. I do. Uh, it's not in my power to do that. It's only the Holy Ghost of God that can give you that assurance or not. Uh, but maybe uh, aside from examining ourselves, we need to understand that these proofs can also 
be used as we consider the testimony of others. Not as if we are God's inspectors to go around and check and make sure everybody's right. Uh, but we are supposed to be witnesses and sowing the seed of the word of God. And what that means is from time to time, uh, and we can say in many times, uh, most times, we're going to run up on people that think they're saved and have no clue what it really means. I listened to a quote just yesterday, a quote from Billy Graham that basically said this, that in the end he believed that somehow or another people could be Christians going to heaven and not know it. And I'm talking, you're talking about an individual that's had a global impact. And if eternity is no gain, if heaven and hell are real, we better make sure not only that we're born again, but that we're, that we're also truthful and honest and thorough in our dealings with others. As we go about our daily witness, we must seek to determine the true spiritual condition of those to whom we witness. Because the number one uh, uh, deceptive tactic of the devil is religion. Right. Not rebellion. Right. Religion. Because when human beings, because of our pride and flesh, the pride of our flesh. It, uh, it uh, demands that we do something to help God out. That in and of itself is an indicator that the individual doesn't understand the nature of God. <laughs> We're saved by faith and kept by His power, the Bible says in 1 Peter 1 and 5. So uh, let me show you another instance in Acts chapter number 19. Acts 19 and verse 1. <laughs> Brother John McBride said that uh, the auditorium Sunday school class was getting ready to Finish up the study you're in and then go into a series entitled Real Christianity. I don't know about you, but I think it's high time for that in America. Amen. Uh, and so I, I, I pray that helps us toward that end. But Acts chapter number 19 and verse 1, watch this. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believe? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. Now there's a problem. Sure. Ain't it? Yeah. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, unto John's baptism. Now, uh, a couple of things here. Number one, I believe that your baptism means something. I believe, based upon this passage of Scripture, that our baptism identifies us with the doctrine of our baptizing authority. Under what then were you baptized? Unto John's baptism. Now, watch, not only do we make note of that, that it was connected, and matter of fact, to show the connection, verse 4 says, then, then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying, 
So that means that whatever he baptized was identified with whatever he preached. See? Saying unto the people they should believe on him, look, which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. So here's the thing. These are John's, they would consider themselves John's disciples. They were disciples, verse 1 tells us. They were John's disciples. John's message was this. You need to look for the Savior to come. Well, at the point that Paul met them, Jesus had already come. He had been crucified and buried and rose again the third day. So what are we saying here? These folks were basically like your modern Jew. They are still looking for the Messiah to come. When in reality, the Messiah has already come. That's why they didn't know that there was even a Holy Ghost. Because they were not genuinely converted. Did John preach truth? Absolutely. I mean, Jesus wouldn't have commended John the Baptist like he did if John had been preaching error. But as soon as Jesus came on the scene, John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Follow Him. Follow Him. So, uh, verse number... Uh, Verse number uh, 6 says, And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Ghost came on them. They spake with tongues and prophesied, and all the men were about 12. Now watch. What's the point of this? Here were these disciples. No doubt he knew that they were some kind of follower or something. But watch what he asked them. In verse 2, Have you received the Holy Ghost? Since you believe. What are you following? Is it based on truth? See? We are living in a day now where if you say the name of Jesus in public, you just got converted. And we are living... Look, have you noticed we're living in a day when people will not allow themselves to be challenged by truth? How dare you question my sincerity? Nobody's questioning anybody's sincerity. What we're questioning is whether or not they've genuinely been born again. And that's biblical to do. If we don't do that and confirm people in a false faith, we make them twofold more the children of hell. This is what I've been saying. We have been so, so long uh, in, in so many fashions, in so many ways. You, you really can't put a, you really can't nail it down. But brother, we, we have gotten really good at playing church and religion. To the point where we are no longer scripturally thorough in our belief system itself. Much less in what we teach others. And this is why we're in a day when we need a series on real Christianity. You see, my time's already gone. It's hard to bring people to earth-shaking, life-changing, conversion experience with God if we never bring them to the point of being a filthy, rotten sinner in the first place. But that's what's going on in churches across our we are so guilty. Even, even some fundamentalists are more concerned about feel good than faithful. You say, preacher, that's not popular. It never has been. But this is what I'm driving at. Our goal is not to be popular with the world. Which is exactly what some of the, uh, the driving force sometimes of our church mentality is. How can we make ourselves acceptable in the eyes of the world? Who cares? 
We weren't sent here. We weren't sent here by God to be acceptable in their eyes. And so our churches started slipping in our faithfulness to truth, in our faithfulness to doctrine, and we started getting scared to really tell people what we really believe because we wanted to be popular with people. And the end result, listen, is hell. Probably for pew rows full across this land. You say you're just trying to scare us. I'm telling you that the Bible says the, that the devil can appear as an angel of light. And some of you have, have uh, been in these religions for years before you came to Christ. And you know what kind of shallow uh, deception, emotional based stuff that goes, that don't help you. When real life sets in. Now, dear church, the burden of this is coming from the heart and the mindset that as we think about the future, and look, we, we've had to tap the brakes in this pandemic. But I, I am more interested. Please understand me. I am more interested in seeing genuine conversions than full pews. That's right. Amen. Now, I do believe this. That if there are genuine conversions, there will be full pews. Amen. Amen. But we start with the truth of the gospel. Right. Not some feel good uh, kind of thing, warm and fuzzy kind of whatever and all over. But a genuine, what does the Bible say? That we are to preach the truth in love. And I think we as a church, uh, and not just our church, but every church that is based on truth, needs to indeed be first of all based on truth. Come what may. God will sort everything out down the road if we'll be focused on His truth. I believe that. I'm not interested in flash in the pan movements. <laughs> I'm interested in genuine conversions. People that are born again, and you can tell 20 years later that they got born again. Amen. Amen. Doesn't mean they're perfect. Doesn't mean they're sinless. Doesn't mean they don't fall before God. We talked about that recently. But go back with me one more time. My time is gone. Acts chapter 2. And down in verse uh, uh 37, Peter's preaching. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. We need to see more of that in our day, for one thing. Look here. Brother, it, it, look here. If, if, if an individual is too proud to get a broken heart, they're never, they're never going to get saved. That's right. That's right. They were bothered by what they heard. And one of the problems with this nation is... We've been so defiled by wickedness and darkness that nothing pricks people's hearts anymore. Calloused, oh my word, they were pricked in their heart. Said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? That's brokenness right there. What in the world am I going to do? We are lost before God. We have crucified our Savior. What kind of wickedness must be in us? What in the world are we going to do? Then Peter said to them, repent. Amen. Repentance is part of the gospel. That's right. <laughs> Amen. That's right. Away with this idea of getting emotional in the service and somebody says, well, now, if you would like to believe on Jesus, we want you to write some kind of little something on your little card and turn it in before you leave. Repent. That means you've done something wrong. That's right. Right. Yes. 
That means you sinned against God. Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. Now the idea is there is not that baptism saves, but that baptism is the picture of the fact that you've been saved. For the remission of sins, that you may receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. All right, so you get the moment you get the moment you believe, you receive the Holy Ghost. For the promise unto you and all your children, all that are far off, even the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Is that not, shouldn't that not be the message of our day? That's right, yeah. so, isn't that what Peter said? That they had to uh, escape the corruption that is in the world through lust? And that's what the same thing said here. Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word. There'll be some. Hallelujah. They that gladly received his word were baptized. Same day added unto them 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly. That's what I'm driving at right there. Uh, some refer to it as the perseverance of the saints. But brother, when you get born again, God changes your nature. And so they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. And breaking of bread and in prayer. That means they continued on in the fellowship, uh, not only of the doctrine, but also with the saints. <laughs> what was the result? Verse 43, and fear came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs done by the apostle. We passed that age now. But verse 44 says, And all that believed were together, had all things common. They sold their possessions and goods and parted them as all men, uh, to all men as every man had need. Verse 46, They continuing daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Now I'm going to tell you one thing. Gladness and singleness of heart does not describe a whole load of churches across this country. Verse 47 says, Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Now I started to say, I meant to say as we began this uh, message, which really we preached the introduction this morning, so we'll come back tonight. Our emphasis is no longer on conversion and salvation. It's on patting ourselves on the back. Taking care of one another. Us four no more. Huh? But the Bible says here that the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. And so somebody says, well, now you go to preaching a Bible message like that, and for sure you finished yourself. No, 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 no. No, no, you've just started. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Ye shall know them by their fruit. I have personally known individuals over the years and had blessed by the Lord to be able to help people come to saving faith in Christ. I'll share this illustration. I shared it with you before and then we'll pray. We had visited this, uh, visited this uh, some, uh, couple that had visited our church and went through the gospel with them, going to visit their home and went through the gospel with them and and they both bowed their head and prayed sinner's prayer, basically. And when we got done, I asked the, I asked the lady, I said, uh, now, if you were to die right now, where would you go? And she said, straight to hell. And I said, why would you say something like that? I must have, oh my goodness, I must have really confused you. Why would you say something like that? She said, it's too easy. 
And I knew right then that she still had yet to place her faith in Jesus. And so I said, at the time, they lived on the fourth floor of a tower, a housing facility there. And I said, well, do you want to go to heaven or hell? You know, something along those lines. Well, I want to go to heaven. I said, well, let me ask you this. I said, uh, if the Bible said to jump off the fourth floor of this tower head first to go to heaven, would you do it? And she said, well, I guess if I wanted to go to heaven bad enough, I would. And then I asked her, I said, but aren't you glad it doesn't say that? And buddy, she got it just like that. She began to weep. And she understood that Jesus paid it all. All to him. I owe it. There were a lot of people that lived like that lady did before she got genuinely born again. They live religiously. But it's all in an effort to try to appease God. Instead of, instead of trusting Jesus Christ, who is the propitiation, which means that he paid justly the sin debt of every person on the face of the planet. You know, there are a lot of people that add Jesus to their own effort. They're good people, religious people, faithful people. They do ministries. They're involved in all of that, just like the folks we talked about earlier. But they're lost. Because the one thing that never happened to them in their, in their heart and their spirit was genuine brokenness before a holy God. Now, I still believe in old-fashioned Bible conversion. I believe that the gospel is a message of repentance and faith. And I believe when God saves people, there's evidence of it. You shall know them by their fruits. That's what we want to look at as we look at a few things in 1 John tonight. Let's stand together and bow our heads for prayer.